Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things, and today I'm going to do my June wrap up and talk about all the books that I read in the month of June. Now, to be technical, today I'm going to talk about all the books that I read in the month of June and on the 1st of July. I went on holiday in the last two weeks of June and I spent the 1st of July coming back from Thailand on a plane, which meant because of the time difference my 1st of July was 30 hours long and I spent most of it reading, so I feel like it would be a bit of a waste to leave the six things that I finished on the 1st of July and not talk about them until the end of July, so we're just going to pretend that June has 31 days and I'm going to talk about the 12 things that I read over June and the 1st of July. Let's start off, as always, with the classics. There were quite a lot of Victorian reads this month. This month I read The Small House at Allington by Anthony Trollope, which is the fifth book in the Barsetshire Chronicles, and I buddy read this with Caroline from BBC Girl. And this was absolutely brilliant. This is probably my favourite book of the year so far that wasn't a reread. It was so good. It was just, oh, it was so good. I love Anthony Trollope so much. He writes so well, and the Barsetshire Chronicles are so wonderful and so rewarding because they're a series of interconnected novels and characters crop up who you've met a little bit before, but they're not. They all feel like individual stories. They don't follow on from each other directly. It's just that there are characters in common and places in common, and I love that. I think it's wonderful. The Small House at Allington is definitely my favourite in the series so far. It beats Barsetshire Towers for me. It can't quite be my favourite, Anthony. Anthony Trollope novel ever because The Way We Live Now is so good and is in like my top 10 books of all time but it's second to that in terms of Anthony Trollope love and it was so so amazing. So to quickly explain a little bit about what The Small House at Allington is about. Allington is a village in the county of Barsetshire. There is a big house at Allington where the squire lives and then there is a small house at Allington where the squire's nieces and their mother live. The book basically follows these two sisters Lily and Belle Dale and their relationships with men, their relationships with their mother and with their uncle and how they get on in society, how everything goes with them. And then we also follow the four men, the four kind of heroes slash anti-heroes of this book, two of which are kind of interested in Belle and two of which are kind of interested in Lily. And it was just wonderful. It reminded me in some ways of Sense of Sensibility in the relationship between the two sisters and some of the action that plays out. We have Belle, the elder sister, who is much more reserved, much more quiet and sensible. And then we have Lily, who is much kind of more giddy and loud and playful and likes to tease everyone. And although she's less like directly romantic than Marianne in Sense of Sensibility, she does have this deep kind of romanticism in her. I love Sense Sensibility a lot. I mean, it's my least favourite Austin, but I still love it a lot. But this was so much better and so much richer and more well, wonderful. It is such a sad and poignant and beautifully sad book and not, it's not heartbreaking or bleak in the way Thomas Hardy is. It's not depressing sad. It's just like life sad, if you know what I mean. It's just the kind of sadness that feels very realistic, very poignant and very true to life. It is absolutely beautiful and it is, yeah, it does feel to me like Sense and Sense ability, but how it would actually happen. I just found the book absolutely wonderful. I love the character of John Eames. John Eames is like my new favourite Anthony Trollope hero for being a wonderful, wonderful character. And all of the characters in this, Mr Crosby, Dr Cross, Bernard Dale, like, I think Anthony Trollope is so good at writing completely realistic characters. And that's one of the things I really like about him, and I know it's one of the things he prides himself on. He has lots of little digs in his novels about how Dickens is so, like, romanticised and melodramatic and over the top, and how he's definitely not, and he's very realistic. And it's kind of true. And I love the melodrama in Dickens, and I love the crazy eccentric characters that aren't quite true to life. But I also love reading Anthony Trollope for his complete realism, and for characters that are utterly believable in the kind of sometimes the worst ways like you really don't want to believe this is how someone would behave but you know they would and the sadness in this book and how close to happiness moments get and fall short of is so poignant and beautiful and it's just incredible it's wonderfully written beautiful character development so engaging it made me laugh and made me like cry on a plane it's just great it's so good i cannot recommend the bastard chronicles enough and yeah the small house at allington is my favorite i also read two sherlock holmes books by arthur conan doyle in the month of June. These Nick and I listened to on audiobook together while we were on holiday. They're both narrated by Stephen Fry, who is just a great, great narrator of so many audiobooks and reads it absolutely beautifully. And we read The Sign of Four by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and also The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Sign of Four is the second Sherlock Holmes mystery after The Study in Scarlet. It deals with a strange mystery, as you always expect in Sherlock Holmes. A young woman comes to visit Holmes and Watson in their rooms and says that many years ago her father disappeared and then a few years after her father's disappearance she starts 
started receiving a pearl with an anonymous note every year. Then she, a few days ago she's received a note asking to meet her somewhere in London. And she takes Watson and Holmes along with her to find out what's going on and everything kind of goes on and unravels from there. It leads back to a very complicated mystery that is all bound up in like Indian colonial rule and so on. Like all Sherlock Holmes it's just really fun. I just enjoy the dynamic between Sherlock Holmes and Watson. And another thing I think I really enjoy about the books is it always makes me laugh and it's something that I feel like the TV adaptations and the modern retellings don't get across is just how like besotted with Holmes Watson is and just how he's like oh great I'd love to come sounds wonderful and he's also always so cheerful and thoroughly excited and so impressed by Holmes in a really like genuine and just like nice way it's quite cute. I also find it interesting how global Sherlock Holmes stories are. Obviously I read a lot of Victorian literature and Victorian literature set in England is obviously influenced by the Empire in many ways and is influenced by what's going on in British colonies abroad but not as directly ever for me as it is in Sherlock Holmes where it's very 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 global where there is a lot about the Empire. I don't know if that's just because it's later Victorian literature and I'm slightly more familiar with early and mid Victorian literature but regardless it's a thing that I find really really interesting and something I really enjoy about them although it does bring kind of very complicated and dubious descriptions. I do think that there are bits in the Sherlock Holmes stories when you can tell that within his time period Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is not a racist like there's a story in the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes which is quite like enlightened for the time period in terms of how British people view people who aren't white. But there are still a lot of things that are very dubious and problematic from a modern perspective. I enjoyed the sign of four a lot but in general I do think I prefer the Sherlock Holmes short stories to the novels. In general I found them a bit better and I feel like the way that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle writes them fits a short story format quite well. I don't know whether I loved or hated the love story that Watson gets in the sign of four. It's so bad. <laughs> like It's one of the most underdeveloped like insta love ridiculous love stories in Victorian literature and it's really like poorly described. Watson's description and his feeling of love and like the little love scenes that occur are so like hilariously bad that I kind of love them and I kind of really enjoy it even though I find it a little bit ridiculous. So yeah I did enjoy The Sign of Four but not as much as I enjoyed The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. So The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes is the second short story collection within the Sherlock Holmes series. I have read the first which comes after The Sign of Four so this is the fourth book in the Sherlock Holmes series I think. So this collection is a series of short stories dealing with various adventures that Holmes goes on all of which I find really brilliant. I Like I said I really love the short story format for Sherlock Holmes. I think it's done very very well and I really enjoy all of the mysteries that get solved. I especially like that they're not all murders because I feel like when you see modern adaptations of Sherlock Holmes you think that they're all going to be murder mysteries whereas actually a lot of them are other kind of mysteries and that's something I really enjoy. I love the dynamic between Holmes and Watson and the relationship and friendship that they have I think is done really really well. A few things I especially enjoyed about this collection and why I think I probably on balance like it more than the other one but only by a little bit is that I really enjoyed finding out about like Sherlock Holmes's early career and what got him into detective work and I also really enjoyed the stories in which we encounter Mycroft his brother and which also we encounter Dr James Moriarty. All in all it was a really enjoyable collection and yes I do enjoy Sherlock Holmes very much. On the plane back from Thailand I had a little bit of a Gaskell binge and I read five Elizabeth Gaskell novellas in a row as you do. In fact I also started a sixth which I've not yet finished so I'll talk about that in July's wrap up but yes the reason why I have been reading lots of Elizabeth Gaskell novellas is because I'm gonna do like a week or two weeks of Elizabeth Gaskell in September when it's her birthday now that I've read all her novels and rank her novels from my least favourite to my favourite and I thought because as well as her longer novels she does have a lot of shorter works like a lot of novellas I might also try and read all her novellas as well so that I can include them in the ranking or like do a separate week so yes that's why I've been rereading slash reading lots of her novellas. Three of these were rereads to me but it's been so long since I read them that I'd kind of forgotten pretty much everything about them so it was really enjoyable to rediscover those three and to read the two new ones. So first I reread Mr Harrison's Confessions by Elizabeth with Gaskell which is a novella of hers that I absolutely adore. It's my favourite novella by her. It's so absolutely brilliant and so lovely and hilarious and so well written. It's about Mr Harrison who is a surgeon. He comes to this small town to work there as a doctor and he's getting on fairly well in his practice. He meets a girl who he falls in love with but this town he lives in is very very female and there are not very many men and he soon finds that everyone wants to marry him and everyone thinks that he wants to marry them and he somehow managed to make it so that everyone is expecting him to propose to them and it's just absolutely hilarious. It was adapted to screen within the BBC Cranford miniseries that happened a few years ago because what they did in there was they took the book Cranford and then they also took Mr Harrison's Confessions and My Lady Ludlow which are two novellas by her and also incorporated them into the miniseries which I am so 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 glad they did because 
because Mr. Harrison Confessions is so underrated and because it's so short it's not something you would ever manage to get a adaptation of unless it was with something else in that and it does work very well with Cranford. But yes, Mr. Harrison's Confessions is just delightful, hilarious and wonderful and such a brilliant, brilliant portrait of like a small town in England at the time. I then also reread My Lady Ludlow, the other one that was adapted within Cranford. My Lady Ludlow is about a young woman who's about 16. She lives with her family, she's the eldest of nine children and her father's just died so her mother writes off to all of their wealthy relations to anyone she can think of however distant to try and get some help and Lady Ludlow who is a distant relation of her father takes her in she already has some other young lady companions who live with her and she takes in this other girl as well the book doesn't really focus on the narrator but more focuses on Lady Ludlow as a character and what she's like there are some things about this that I absolutely love I think it is the worst structured of a list of Gaskell's novellas and there's a big chunk in the middle like a good kind of third of the book which is like a story within a story about the French Revolution which is interesting but doesn't feel like it belongs there. I don't think it's as well structured or as poised or as well written as a lot of Elizabeth Gaskell but I do really like it and I do think there are bits of brilliance in there especially in the portrayal of Lady Ludlow because she is incredibly socially conservative. She is a complete snob. She believes that everyone in the lower classes should not have any education because that will damage them. She has a lot of old fashioned opinions, opinions that were old fashioned at the beginning of the 19th century when this is set and are obviously incredibly old fashioned now, which are very distasteful. And yet, she is a very sympathetic person and you do see the kindness and goodness in her and you understand that she is a product of her time and you can still respect her in some way. And I think that's very, very cleverly done and really, really interesting because it's just a true and complex portrait of a person. I also really like the narrator's plotline, although she kind of plays it down, it's much more about Lady Ludlow. The narrator is quite interesting, she develops like a hip problem and has struggles to walk and is disabled for the bulk of the story and the way that she writes about this and the presentation of disability in this way is very very interesting. At some point in the ongoing the not so hypothetical Victorian literature course series I do want to make a video on the presentation of disability in Victorian literature because in general it's really bad. In general in a lot of Victorian literature and I'm sorry to say in most of Dickens, characters with disabilities are either villains, they are either completely evil and their disability and their evilness are bound up together or they are sort of victims and nothing more. And Elizabeth Gaskell I think is one of the authors who breaks this the most and does the most interesting things and has a lot of characters who just have disabilities. The next Elizabeth Gaskell novella I read was Cousin Phyllis. This was also a reread but it's been at least 10 years I would say since I read it. It's been a really really long time and I didn't remember anything. But I really did enjoy this a lot. It's about a young man who works as a clerk in a railway company and he goes to this new town, he's away from home and he discovers that his mother has some distant relations here, distant cousins who live in the neighbourhood. He goes to visit them and he finds he has a cousin Phyllis and her parents and he becomes friends with them and the book is kind of about his relationship with his cousin and with her parents and also what happens when he brings his best friend into close contact with his cousin and the relationship between his cousin and his best friend. There are a lot of things I love about it. One thing I really like about it a lot is the relationship between the narrator, between Paul and Phyllis because they don't fall in love and they don't have a romantic relationship despite the fact that I think that's kind of what you would expect and actually they just have a really good like nice friendship and it's nice to have a male female friendship in Victorian literature because there aren't actually that many and it's just something I really really like about this story. Cousin Phyllis is a really enjoyable well written story like always with Elizabeth Gaskell she writes beautifully and it's really well structured really really good and yeah I recommend it very very highly. I then also read Lois the Witch, another Elizabeth Gaskell novella. So this was very, very interesting and quite different. I say quite different to the rest of her books, but one of the things I love about Elizabeth Gaskell is how all of her books are very, very different to each other. Lois the Witch is set in the late 17th century and a young girl called Lois, after the death of her parents, moves from the UK to America. She goes over to the New World to find the only relation she has left and she ends up in Salem. And you can imagine from the book being called Lois the Witch and the fact that she ends up in Salem in the late 17th century kind of what goes on. She gets caught up in the witch trials and the witchcraft scares of that time. It's really interesting in terms of the history and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I didn't find the plot or the characters quite as well developed as in other Elizabeth Gaskell novels but I think that's partly because it's more focused on like the point and the purpose of it. Although it's probably not my favourite Elizabeth Gaskell novella I would definitely recommend reading it and I do think it is quite an interesting book. Then I also read Lizzie Lee by Elizabeth Gaskell and this I think is probably a short story rather than a novella. It's hard to tell on Kindle but I feel like it was quite a lot shorter than the others. Lizzie Lee is very very interesting and I would highly highly recommend 
recommend reading it. Basically it deals with a family, the Lee family, and after the father's death the mother decides that she really wants to go and track down her daughter who has been estranged for them for some years after she was dismissed from her place from her position of work because she had got pregnant outside of marriage and she basically goes to find this girl. Elizabeth Gaskell exploring how these so-called fallen women within Victorian society are treated and there's a lot of things in Lizzie Lee in that aspect that are really really interesting and really really well done. It's definitely worth a read and I would highly recommend it. So those are all the Victorian novels I read at the month of June. Let's move on to some literary fiction. I read The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ajao which I buddy read with Catadactyl. I'll link her channel down below. I really really enjoyed this. I didn't like it quite so much as Yoko Ajao's Revenge which is an absolutely incredible beautiful wonderful interconnected series of short stories but I think that's possibly just because I love interconnected short stories and they're like my favourite thing. They're like the pinnacle of form for me but I did still really enjoy this a lot. It is about a housekeeper and a professor, as it may not surprise you to hear. This woman who is a housekeeper goes to work in the house and clean the house of a man who is a retired professor of mathematics. Many years ago he was in a car accident and since then he has only been able to remember 90 minutes at a time. So every hour and a half his memory restarts and he can't remember anything that's happened since the 1970s. And the book basically deals with this woman's relationship with the professor and also the professor's relationship with her 10 year old son who comes to do his homework in the house while she's working there. But it's about how these three people with all of their problems form a kind of family and that's beautiful and I love it. I also love the mathematics in this which is strange but so I used to love maths at school like until I was 16, 17 I was always going to do maths at university. Maths was my favourite subject and then I kind of realised that I actually liked books more than maths and I do miss maths sometimes because I used to be able to do exciting things with numbers and I can't anymore. I've forgotten. I can't even differentiate equations anymore and it was so nice to just experience all the maths in this. I thought it was a really nice, nice aspect of it to see how the professor thinks of the world in terms of numbers and how his relationship with numbers affects his relationship with the housekeeper and her son. And I would highly, highly recommend it. I need to read more by her in the future because, yes, she is brilliant. And then I also read The Wilderness by Samantha Harvey. Now, Sam Harvey was actually one of the tutors on my creative writing masters that I did a few years ago. I read her most recent novel, Dear Thief, a few years ago when I was on the course, but this has been sat on my shelf for ages. I really enjoyed The Wilderness. It's about a man called Jacob who is suffering from Alzheimer's but it flips between his present day and his past although his past is always kind of shadowed and you don't quite know how accurate he is in the way he thinks this is third person narrative but it is quite involved within Jacob's head. The way that his Alzheimer's is presented and the way it changes and develops and becomes worse over the course of the book I thought was brilliantly superbly done. It's also just just beautifully written like the language in here is wonderful. Sam is such such a good writer. I also really enjoyed the fact that Jacob's an architect and the way building especially sort of after the second world war when so many things have been bombed and destroyed, the way that building is so important to him, the importance of creation. I don't think I love this quite as much as Dear Thief, but I think for like personal reasons rather than it being any better. So I feel like I was supposed to like Jacob a little bit more than I did. I don't know, because he is also a problematic character and that is also like acknowledged, but I still feel like I was supposed to like him a little bit more than I did. But regardless, I did really, really enjoy The Wilderness very much. Then I also read The Accidental by Ali Smith, which I sort of buddy read with Marissa from Blakely Bookish. I say sort of because we both like just kind of time slipped away from us and we read it rather out of sync. Although I really liked The Accidental, I didn't like it as much as How To Be Both and I'm trying to work out why. I don't know, I, I'm finding it hard because I don't know whether I liked How To Be Both more because it was the first thing of Ali Smith I'd read so I was like amazed by her writing style whereas obviously now I've read How To Be Both and I've also read two of her short story collections so this is less new and fresh to me which I think means the writing blows me away less. Um, and I also feel like it's partly just like the stage I'm in, I'm in less of a literary fiction mood at the moment. I'm gonna make a video about this, I'm gonna make a video about like classics versus literary fiction and like about plots and what literary fiction is and how whether I actually like it. I do, obviously I do, like but I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna make a whole another video. This is a topic for another occasion. The Accidental is about a family of four, two children, one of who's about 17, one of who's 12, and their mother and their stepfather. They go on holiday for the summer. While they're there, a woman called Amber kind of comes it along and befriends them all and sort of works her way into their lives and everything kind of goes on from there. And there are some things about this that I loved. I loved the narrative voice. I love the fact that Ali Smith, although she writes in the third person, manages to capture these voices of the four members of the family 
so distinctly and so brilliant I thought it was wonderful especially Astrid the young girl who's 12 I thought her voice was done superbly I really enjoyed the bits that were from the perspective of Astrid or from Magnus who's her elder brother who's 17 I really enjoyed their characters and their storylines a lot and I thought they were very well done the parents or the mother and stepfather I didn't find their plot lines as interesting or as well developed and I just didn't understand their relationship at all he has tons of affairs and she's just fine with it and we don't ever really get a sense of why she's fine with it and I felt like more of their relationship had to be made I don't know but I think the main reason why I didn't love this as much as have we both apart from like timing and stuff is just I didn't find the central conceit believable or that interesting like Amber is a really interesting character and the way she kind of makes every individual member of the family sort of fall in love with her in a way I found really interesting but it didn't feel believable and that was a shame because the rest of the book and the way that these four characters feel in the family and the way they act felt very very real and felt very believable and felt very realistic and then you have this kind of weird surreal element running through the middle which didn't it didn't work for me i didn't love it as much as how to both like i've got autumn by ali smith on my shelves which i'll probably read and i might read a couple of other books by her in the future but I'm no longer like desperately eager to read everything she's ever written. I no longer think that she will be like one of my favourite authors, which I think I thought when I first read How To Be Both. I like her a lot and I think she's good, but I don't think she is as for me as I thought she was, if that makes sense. But regardless, I would still recommend The Accidental and I think there are a lot of other people who it may be for more. Then I also read one non-fiction book in the month of June, which I listened to an audiobook, and that was Sapiens by Noah Nuval Harari. Sapiens sets out to be a history of humanity, basically, a history of homo sapiens since they existed until now and there were some things I really liked about this mainly the historical bits I really enjoyed learning about the history of the human race over millions of years especially the older stuff the prehistoric stuff which I don't know that much about the way that sapiens looked at that and how the move from hunter-gatherer societies to agricultural societies changed the way humanity worked and changed the direction which we developed afterwards I found really really fascinating and I really really liked that aspect of the book I loved what I didn't like as much was the philosophical elements of it and it is a history book but it's also a philosophy book and it's also a philosophy of history in a way and a philosophy of how humanity has developed and I found the philosophical bits less interesting and a bit pretentious. I like the historical stuff where he was actually talking about what happened and what that might suggest but sometimes he went off on quite philosophical tangents and I didn't enjoy that as much and in fact it is quite a tangential book in general and he goes off on a lot of tangents and I feel like I probably felt that even more listening to the audiobook though it is a very well narrated audiobook and it is good to listen to so I did like Sapiens I would recommend it I think it was very very interesting um, and I probably at some point will read the sequel Homo Deus which is about like what happens to humanity from now on what will happen to humanity in the future because I think it will be really really interesting so those are all the books that i read in the month of june i hope you have a good reading month in june let me know what your favorite book of the month was i'll be back very soon with another bookish video and in the meantime happy reading